All right, a few just a few announcements to let you know about. Our uh, Easter service will be one service. It'll be at 10 a.m. on March the 31st. We have an early Easter this year. So we're going to meet and have one service at 10 a.m. We're not going to do Bible study or anything. We're just going to have worship service at 10 a.m. And then we'll have an egg hunt and stuff for the kids to do. And so there'll be some fun stuff afterwards. We're going to keep it real simple this year for Easter. Also, our Vacation Bible School is coming up June, 20th, June 23rd through the 26th. And the theme is scuba. It's going to be all about underwater stuff and, and uh, keeping your head above water, I guess. I don't know. But it'll be fun. We'll have a great time with that. So that's Vacation Bible School. If you'd like to volunteer, help, assist in any way, please see Nicole. She'll be glad to enlist you. And it's never too soon to start enlisting to help with Vacation Bible School. It's a lot of fun. This room will fill up with kids, and it gets loud and fun, and it's just a big party. And we have a great time, so hope that you'll be there. And that's going to be an evening Vacation Bible School. Also, March the 10th, which is two Sundays away, we spring forward. We spring forward. So remember that on March the 10th, we spring forward. So if you show up at this time in two weeks and didn't spring forward, then you in time for Bible study, right? Yeah, I'll be ready for Bible study. So a lot of people are going to say, I'm not changing my clock. I'll have to listen to that preacher. Okay. And let's see what else. Annie Armstrong Easter offering. There's a, a prayer guide that's been passed out on the, in the seats in, around you. Uh, Feel free to take one of those home with you. It tells you all about what Annie Armstrong Easter Offering is doing. Uh, one of the missionaries that's highlighted in here is in the city of Las Vegas, where I once served as a missionary. And Annie Armstrong uh, Mission Offering gave us lots of resources to help reach that city for Christ. That city still needs lots of reaching for the Lord Jesus. So they're sending a family there to uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, my beloved other home on this planet love all the people in las vegas now uh, today we're going to look at god's will according to sears and roebuck remember sears and roebuck so it's a god's will according to sears and roebuck the wish book so if there's anybody watching online you say oh, that preacher's a heretic calm down it's just an illustration though it's just going to be an illustration all right let's go to the lord in prayer and let's remember to pray for our church pray for our community Let's pray that revival comes to our church. Father God, we thank you so much for all of the goodness and blessings that you've given us throughout the week. And Lord, as we gather together in this place today to worship you, help us, Lord, to be mindful of the many wonderful things you do for us and the many wonderful gifts and blessings, friends, family, co-workers, the people who touch our lives. We thank you for them. You give us many treasures to be treasured. Help us, Lord, to love people the way you love them. And during this time, Lord, as we worship you, we pray that you'll open our eyes to understand your will, to have a better comprehension of it, how to find it, and how to live it. And Father God, we pray today that as we worship you, we pray that it will bring revival in each and everyone's heart and mind. And Lord, that that energy and that enthusiasm for you will spread out from us and touch the people around us. Lord, we desperately need revival in our church, Amen. in our community, and in our nation. And we ask, Lord God, that you will help us to come now, not wait until things get even worse, but to come now and to humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways. And then you'll heal our land. Our land needs healing, Lord, and you're the only one that can do it. It's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. All right. Well, good morning. It's good to see you today. Let's stand together and we sing Holy, Holy, Holy. <clears throat>
you. You may be seated. Holy, holy, holy. All the saints adore thee. When the saints go marching in. I'm a pilgrim and a stranger. saints that are going to be marching in meantime on this side of heaven what a friend it is we have in jesus <coughs> Take it to the Lord in prayer and cherish those times of sweet hour of prayer. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Man, you don't find the third verse in most of the modern hymn books. That's the sweetest verse on the face of the earth. Look, listen to it again. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer. May I thy consolation bear, share. Till from Mount Pusia's lofty height, I view my home and take my flight. Now pay attention. This robe of flesh, this body, I'll drop and rise to seize the everlasting prize. And think about what the last thing is. Farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. You know what? You're going to not need a sweet hour of prayer anymore. And what a blessing that song is, Pastor. It's a good, good point you made there, David. I was having a conversation with my daughter last year, and she said, you know, she said, when we get to heaven, there'll be no need for prayer any longer. I looked at her, and she goes, all we'll do is praise. We won't pray anymore. We won't wrestle with prayer anymore. <laughs> she said, all the wrestling's done. Now it's the praising. That's why it's a place of rest. It's a place of, of reunion and a place of celebration, and it's a great, great place to be. And you want to be there, and I want to be there. Uh, we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer again this morning. Uh, this is uh, looking at God's will according to Sears and Roebuck. Sears and Roebuck. You remember Sears and Roebuck? We'll get to that part in just a minute. Uh, we're looking at the Lord's Prayer, and we're looking at the importance of the Lord's Prayer, and that it's a model for us, it teaches us, but you can pray that prayer. Just pick it up and pray it. If you don't know anything else to pray, you say, I don't know what to pray. Just pray the Lord's Prayer. And earnestly, uh, just give, open your heart to it, and God will answer each and every one of these. As Martin Luther said, uh, the best prayers are the ones with the fewest words. There's only 66 words in the Lord's Prayer. And the center of that prayer is the word forgive, because that's everything that the Bible's about. It's the expression of God's love. It's the expression of his acceptance. It's the mission of his son, Jesus Christ. It's why he died on a cross for us. He, he came to forgive us and to spare us from the wrath of his heavenly Father. God's holiness uh, will not tolerate sin. And Jesus Christ stepped into place for us and hung between heaven and earth and sacrificed his life a ransom for many. And when we come to him and express our need for his forgiveness, we recognize he's our Savior. He stepped in our place. He took a punishment we deserved. For all eternity. We deserve that for all eternity. And Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And he did it to be a mediator between God and man. Literally between heaven and earth. Now let's take a look. Uh, we're, we're going to be uh, today. We're going to be uh, in uh, Matthew uh, 21. And we're going to look at a passage of scripture here. And then we're going to look at uh, Romans 12 too. So I would tell you to put. Put your finger in uh, Romans 12, and I'll pick up the other parts, and you can go back and read them. But the prayer, the Lord's Prayer, is in the Sermon on, on the Mount. It's in the middle of the sermon. So Jesus Christ uh, teaches us how to pray in the middle of his sermon. Uh, the sermon uh, covers so many issues. Uh, how do we relate to others, and how we relate to God, and how we find forgiveness, and how we uh, solve problems, conflicts between other people, even to the point that we're uh, dragged to court. He deals with all these things. But in the middle of this, he tells us how to pray. And this is what he said. He said, in this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father. Nowhere do you find uh, any personal pronouns, a singular. It's always plural pronouns. Our, us, we. It's about being in the family of God. Our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven and we've looked at our father we've looked at the kingdom and now we're going to look at the will be done in earth as it is in heaven uh, god's will what is god's will when you think about it it says it there but many times we wonder well, what exactly does it mean god's will well we're going to take a look at a few things here about god's will uh, later in this uh, sermon jesus says in seven Matthew 7, 21 through 23, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not preached in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? 
And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So the Lord's will, doing the Lord's will, avoids lawlessness. When we don't do God's will, then we're acting in a lawless way. We're acting in a way that does not appreciate what God has done for us. And our expression of our appreciation for his salvation, his grace, his goodness, his love, is to do his will. And Jesus also said in Matthew 12, 50, Whoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven is the same as my brother, my sister, and my mother. So he's saying to us, we're in the family of God when we do God's will. Matthew 21, 28 through 32, Jesus gives a parable concerning doing God's will. He says, what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and he said, son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and he said, I will not. But afterwards, he regretted it, and he went. Then he came to the second and said, likewise, to the other son. And he answered and said, I'll go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? And they all said to him, the first. Jesus said to them, assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. Jesus Christ is clearly saying to us that a relationship with him is what supersedes a religious lifestyle of saying, I'm going to do something, but never doing it. And there's a lot of people who put on the clothing of religion, but they never practice or live out the word of God. They never do what the word of God teaches us to do. So let's talk about the three ways to understand God's will and how to do it. So we're going to be in Romans 12, and we're going to look in verse 2, 1 and 2, of this very famous passage here, these two verses. Many Christians memorize this particular passage, and Paul is explaining to us about the will of God. He's going to tell us how to understand the will of God. So here's what we're going to see. We're going to see several things he's going to teach us here today that I hope will help clarify if you're looking to do God's will. If you say, I'm not sure if this is God's will or not, this is going to help. He says in verse 1, Paul says to the Romans, and remember the Romans are highly intelligent people. These are brilliant people, well-educated people. They're not ignorant at all. This is a society of well-educated people. And he's talking to one of the most literate and most intelligent congregations uh, in the New Testament. He says, I beseech you therefore, that means I plead with you, I beg of you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And in the Greek, it means service of worship. It's a form of worship when we're living sacrifices and we're striving to be holy and acceptable unto God. That is an expression of worship. It's a lifestyle. It's not just singing songs, but it's living the Christian life. Now listen further to what he says here. And Paul is brilliant. Remember, he's an incredibly educated man. This is one who would have multiple PhDs and master's degrees. Uh, he, he, he went to the finest schools of the known world at that time, read the finest literature. Um, I told you about, he talked about the fourth dimension in one passage of Scripture. It was incredible, expressing this world in the, in the, heavens, in the heavenly realm. But listen to what he says, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So I brought my board out today. Usually I save this on Sunday mornings, but we're going to look at some things here about God's will. So there's three things he tells us to do. He says, don't be conformed. Don't be conformed. Okay, don't be conformed, he says. Second, he says, to renew your mind. There's a renewal. And he tells us that we are to um, 
discern or know or prove what is that perfect will of God. And if you look, it says, he says right there in verse 2, he says, that you may prove. That pr the word prove here means to discern by action. To be able to discern or decipher by doing it. Okay? It's practicing it. So, don't be conformed. That's a non-conformist. Boy, that's a word that we hear in our <laughs> society today. Non-conformist. Renewal and then proving or being able to discern rightly the will of God. So, do not be conformed to this world. Well, let's take a look at what Jesus said in John 14, 6. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. What is he telling us here? Well, if you're not going to be conformed to this world, then he is what? He's the way that we live in this world. And then, look what he says about the renewal of our mind. And he says, and be transformed by the renewal of your mind. How do we do that? That's through the truth. That's knowing the word of God. And Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth. And then to be able to prove, to live out the, God's will is the life. It's the life that he wants us to live. So here we see already in this model of what Jesus Christ is presenting, to, uh, what Paul is presenting to us is a mirror image of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ that we're to be called out of the world. We're not to be like the world. We are to be nonconformist in this world. So in doing so, we're following the way. We're living a life that rep represents and reflects Jesus Christ. Second, the renewal of our mind. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And that he thought it not humble. He humbled himself and he thought it not being wrong to be what? Clothed in the flesh and live among us and be a sacrificial lamb for us. We're to renew our minds and live a life of obedience just as Jesus did. How do we renew our mind? The truth. The Bible, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. There's Jesus Christ. And to prove that is to live out by experience with discernment the will of God, that's the life. Okay, this pen's not working well. Let's try another one. All right, let's go further, and here's what it says. We see, we see these three things, and they all reflect Jesus Christ. Every one of them. Now, when we pray and we ask God for his direction, his will, we get three answers. So we've got, we've got three steps here to find God's will. And then when we pray and we ask for his direction, his will, we get three answers. Remember what those are? They're yes, they're no, or they're wait. Now, I have heard some prayer requests, and I'll say there's a fourth category, no way. There's no way he's going to answer that. So, you know, so that's a, a big no. All right, so when we pray, sometimes God will say yes, and it, it'll just fall into place. Uh, one of the most remarkable prayers that I ever prayed was a simple prayer about my radio ministry. I was sitting on the front porch at 2 a.m., uh, the fourth anniversary is coming up this June. And I was sitting on my front porch and I was listening to um, J. Vernon McGee. Uh, may I say to you, my friend, J. Vernon McGee, and at the end of his broadcast, the announcer said, and of course, J. Vernon McGee has been dead for years. He, uh, he's from Texas. And he had old southern drawl, you know, that country drawl. And then he went to California and he carried that drawl with him. But at the end of that broadcast, it said, J. Vernon McGee can be heard in 120 countries around the world. And I'm sitting on my front porch. And my radio ministry had been struggling, been around for a while, and not, not much was going on. And all I said was this, Lord, it sure would be nice if my little program could be heard around the world. That's all I did. It was at 2 o'clock in the morning. I remember looking at my thing. It was a little after 2 a.m. I got up. My wife was already asleep. I climbed into bed and went to sleep. Didn't say a word to anybody. When I woke up, my wife had left because she was off to work. I rolled out of bed, fixed myself a cup of coffee, was sitting there in the living room, had my quiet time, and I opened up my email, and right there, at that morning, was a request, an, an invitation from a shortwave radio ministry 
It said, we've been listening to your broadcast, and we'd like to invite you to be a part of our lineup, and you'll be heard in 120 countries around the world. I never said a word to a soul. I never, and so when I contacted the guy, he said, well, we want you to pray about us. I don't have to. I already prayed. I prayed this morning at 2 a.m. That's immediate answer. That sometimes that's a rare thing for that to happen, but it happened. Why? Because it was in his will. It was in his will. I prayed a prayer, and God said, well, I'm going to give you that. And he's provided the money, the resources, and everything for that to happen, and it'll be four years this June. But there's also times I've prayed for things, and God said, nope, you're not going to have it. Why? I don't have to explain that to you. Just go. Trust me. And there's been times I've had to wait. And the waiting is the hardest part because we look at it when we don't understand God's economy of time. But in the process of this, they're all designed to make us more into the image of Jesus Christ. And what did Jesus pray in the Garden of Gethsemane? We're about to see that at this Easter season. He said, Lord, if there's, Father, if there's any way this cup can pass, this cup of wrath can pass, let it be. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. What was he saying? I really want you to say, yes, that cup can pass, because he'd seen crucifixions every day of his life. It's not like it was something he didn't know. They walked up and down roads. They had people crucified up and down the roads all the time. He watched their agony. He watched their deaths. And he knew that was facing him. He knew his mission. And he began to look and go, is there another way we can do this besides me having to go through this? Because it is hell on earth. And to this day, historians say it is the most excruciating, most awful form of capital punishment ever devised by man. Because people could live on a cross as much as six days. And when you died, they just left your remains there and the buzzards ate your body. And that was, that was to tell everybody, don't mess with Rome. You mess with us, this is what your fate is. So Jesus knew that was coming. And then there's times that we have to wait. But it's all to put us in the mindset of doing God's will. Now let's take a look at what this says because he says... That he says, first of all, don't be conformed. That means don't be molded into or become like the world. In other words, the value systems of the world is not our value systems. What the world says is valuable and important and you must have is separate from what the Christian says. It's not about name recognition or, or money or, or popularity. Th th that's not what we live for. We, we live to glorify God. And we live to point others to him and to say, your life's a mess like my life has been a mess. But Jesus Christ is putting me back together and he can put you back together too. Let me share with you. And we live that life. We speak that life. We practice that life. We serve with that in mind to other people. That's part of what we are. And when he says, don't be conformed, it, the Bible says to be separate, to come out from among them. We're not to be like that. Why? Because that's the way we're to live. And as I've said many times, Jesus Christ didn't come to turn the world upside down. It's already upside down. He came to turn the world right side up. And that's why everyone has such a problem with him. Because he's like, he's not doing what everyone else is doing. Of course he's not. He says, my path is narrow and straight and few there be to find it. So our point is to point him to the way. If we want to know God's will, God's will is not going to go the way of the world. God's will is going to be different. It doesn't mean if you get a promotion at work, that's not God's will. But what he is opening the door for you is to be mindful of the fact that you are like a missionary. You are a missionary for him in whatever position of leadership or place you have in, in this secular world. And that's another thing. We live in this. And it's it's a, to be separate, but to also we have to live in it. We have to live among people who are not like us. And that's why Paul says we have to have our our. our conversation seasoned with grace uh, the, the 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 unmerited favor of god and, and not to insult them and if they insult us we don't trade insults we we respond with truth to their insulting of our faith uh, but getting in heated debates and arguments and insulting one another is not going to solve the problem so we're not to be conformed to this world we're not to act like the world and jesus christ put it like this in, in this same Sermon on the Mount where we see the Lord's Prayer, he said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's how 
That's how we live out the, uh, the, the will of God. It, that's what it does. It brings light. When we live the, the will of God, it brings forth light in a world of darkness. That's one of the things that validates what Jesus Christ is telling us, and that's what Paul is saying here. So we aren't molded into the value systems of this world, to the ethics of this world. But he says, be transformed. That is, uh, by the renewal of your mind. The transformation at this point, this renewal, it comes through the truth. God's word reprograms us to see the world as God sees it. One of the most amazing things that's come out today, um, Barna Research has found over 75% of Christians today no longer hold a Christian worldview, a biblical worldview. What does that mean? That 75% of people who call themselves evangelicals, who call themselves Christians, no longer say that the sins of the world are really meant the way they're written in the Bible. Now, they just revised the revised standard. I don't know if you've seen this. They revised the revised standard in such a way that all this gender fluid things and all that's going on in our society, they've rewritten the Bible again to completely take that out. And the Lutherans are one of the ones that are embracing this new revised standard. So the Bible is constantly being updated to meet the culture of the day. And Jesus Christ did not update his message to meet the culture of the day. He said, every word, every dot and tittle will be fulfilled. I'm not going back and changing. I'm not negotiating. Jesus is not fluid in his message. He's stark in his message. It's night or dark day. It's darkness or light. It's good or it's evil. It's right or it's wrong. It's holy or it's wicked. Jesus Christ, there's no gray area with Jesus Christ. So we know that in order to know God's will, it's not going to conform to the value systems of the world. And second, we, in order to understand and discern God's will, we're going to need to have a renewal of our thinking. And that comes from the word of God, the truth. And Jesus Christ is the living truth. He is the word personified. He became, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we know that's how we understand and begin to recognize what is God's will in my life. And then third, it says, renewing, that you may prove, that is, that you, you can live it, what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You will know and discern what God's will is for your life. Now, there's three things he says here. And this is where Sears comes into play here. All right, you remember Sears? Sears, uh, the Sears plan, or the Sears way, was there's good. Thank you, Gary. Better and best. There's the good, the better, and the best. Now, I don't know if you remember, you remember oh, um, um, Ted Williams, the baseball player. When, when I was a kid growing up, we always loved to get the Sears Christmas catalog, and I always went into the sporting goods section, and if I wanted a new baseball glove or I knew I wanted a new football or whatever, they had a good, a better, and best of those, ball, those, those uh, balls or those baseball gloves or the baseball or the bats or whatever they had in there, fishing lures, fishing poles, boats, you name it. They had a good, a better, and a best. Now, this is exactly what the Apostle Paul is telling us long before Sears and Roebuck was ever in, in existence. Because he says, good and acceptable and perfect. This is not a coincidence. He's not reinforcing. He's showing you there's three different understandings of God's will. And so here they are. First is the good. What is the good? The good is the thing that benefits you benefits the individual it's good this is good you look you look and you go this, this, this is a good idea i think this is going to be a good idea and you pray about it you seek the lord and you try to discern what it is it's something that you desire okay so the good is something that's this it's desirable here's a uh, here's one of the uh, scripture verses that relates to that it says 
in Proverbs 18, 22. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. So if you find someone you want to marry and you, you say, you know, this, this is the right person. I believe this is the person that's going to be uh, the right person for me to marry. You found a good thing and you found favor in the Lord. So the good says it's, it's desirable and it has God's favor. He's not against it. It's, it's morally good. It's beneficial. Uh, it can bring some joy and happiness in your life. It's upright. It's honorable. It produces beneficial benefit, beneficial effects. So something that's good benefits. It has benefits to it. Then you have the better form here, which is acceptable. The Bible, Paul uses the term acceptable. So you got goodwill, and then you got acceptable will. What does that mean? That everyone's able to agree on it. It's suitable. This is the benefit of the group. This benefits the group. For instance, um, this church made a decision about a building project. And everyone came together, discussed it, had committees and people looking into it, investigating. And then they went through the process of looking and they sought out what was good. And then they came to a place where this is, this is, this is going to be acceptable. This is going to benefit the group. And everyone came to consensus about it. So all of the work that went into looking at the benefits of the building, now they look at it and say, okay, here's, here's everything that we can share with you. We believe this is God's will for our church. This is the direction we believe we should go. This is where we think we should spend some of the money that's coming in. And it's a benefit to the overall group. That's acceptable. It means that God accepts it. It's, it's acceptable. It's, it's benefiting the group. It's agreeable. Everyone's agreeing to this. Yes, yes, we're good with this. And then there's the perfect will of God. And that's the best. Now here is what that means. In the Greek language, the word perfect or perfection means that it's brought to its end and it's finished in the fullness of time. Listen carefully. It's brought to its end and finished in the fullness of time with nothing necessary to complete it. So the perfect will of God is the overall will for you and it comes across this, I've, I've lived the life that God wanted me to live. This is what he wanted. Obviously, what would that include? Well, that would first be start with your salvation it's God's will that none should perish but all come to repentance so we we have our salvation experience that starts the process we're no longer conformist in this world we're non-conformist and we start the renewal process through the truth and we're able to prove that is discern to live out the life that God wants by doing God's will we're doing the will of God that's good we're doing the will of God that's better and we're doing the will of God that's best the good and the better help blend together to make the best. That's what he's saying here. So good decisions that we make, financial decisions, uh, marriage decisions, relationship decisions, work decisions. We're seeking God's approval and understanding through the truth. We're renewing our mind. We're nonconformist. I had a friend one time that had a big time job. I won't say where because there's lots of listeners on there. And he had a big time position. And he was up for a promotion. And the person who was in the power to promote him said, I, I'll give you this job, but you know, you're really, you're really hard on your evaluations here. If you'll just rework these evaluations, that door's going to open for you. And the person that I know who was up for that promotion said, I gave an honest assessment of the productivity and the lack of productivity in that section where I was working and he said I refuse to change my records on that and he got passed over for the promotion and someone else got it and within six months they had a mess on their hands because they promoted someone who was not qualified and they and they got someone who was fudging the records all the time and all of a sudden when they came in and and they they, they always would come in and, and do these um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, what's that? I can't hear. What? No, not you, her. Audits. They came into audit. And when they came into, sorry, Gary, but that's not, I don't know what that word is, but they came into audit this office, and when they came into audit the office, they found all these falsified records. Why? But he did not want to conform to the value systems of the world. He wasn't going to lie about it. And through that, he, how did he come to that conviction? Through the renewal of his mind. He said, the truth is the truth, and lies are lies, and I'm not going to do it. And as a result of that, it proved, it discerned that he did do God's will by not falsifying and it also proved that they were not following the best because they were punishing someone who was living a life of integrity and so sometimes there's a fallout when we do God's will but when we make the right decisions the best decisions we can make good decisions how we raise our kids and how we spend our money how we spend our time if we make good decisions there good decisions about our health then they're going to open up better positions and then ultimately there's the best and that is the overall life that God wants you to live and that means that you're meeting or you're living a life that's beyond expectations I can't believe looking back the blessings and so people look back and they live a life and they say well I've had some mistakes I've made some regrets but overall I'm so glad that I live for the Lord now here's some things to close with if I got time let me see I got time. I'm going to read these to you. Here's four wills of God for sure. The Bible clearly says this. 1 Peter 2.15 says this. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Okay, that's the will of God. For us to live a life that's nonconformist and that it reflects the renewal of the mind that you're experiencing through the word of God and you're proving by living the word of God, it puts to silence many of the foolish people. And Jesus said, as I read to you in Matthew 5, 16, your light shines before men. They see your good works and they glorify your father. Not you, your father. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 19, uh, 3, 9 says this. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How do we do that? By sharing his truth. Here's a third one. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you obtain, abstain from sexual immorality. That's what he says. This is the will of God, your sanctification. What is sanctification? The pursuit of purity. It's seeking purity in our lives again not conforming to the world and first Thessalonians 5 18 says this in everything giving thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you a living a life that's thankful that's where the Thanksgiving comes right here when we're doing God's good will when we're doing God's acceptable will and we're doing God's perfect will when we're doing his good will his acceptable will and his perfect will, we should be living a life of gratitude. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. People who are thankful, people who are grateful, are always humble people. Every single time. You never see that in prideful people, but you'll always see it in people who are humble. So today, as we look at all of this, let's be mindful of the fact that God has a good will for you, an acceptable will for you, and a perfect will for you. The perfection of that will, the perfect will, that best will, we're not going to know it until we live out this life to its completion. We're not going to fully know it. We'll know the starting point, that's our salvation and walk with the Lord, but it's not going to always be clearly seen until we look at the life that we've lived and at the end we realize I have done the will of God I've done it to the best of my ability I've sought to live his will and as a result of that you've lived out the seer's plan the good the better and the best the good the acceptable and perfect will of God I don't know where you are today in your life and seeking God's will but here's what we know thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. God has a will that's being done in heaven, and he wants that same will done here on earth. And if we'll go and start off by not being conformed to this world, but let our mind be renewed through the word of God, we'll be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And in doing so, we won't make many mistakes. We'll make a lot more right choices. Mistakes become less, and the steps become better when we walk with him. Father God, thank you for this day. We thank you for the, your will. And then, Lord, it's not complicated if we're just honest. If we just put it to your standard, your standard of righteousness, your standard of integrity, your standard of what you want of us. And Lord, we are all a work in progress, but help us to understand that not every decision we make is going to be perfect. Not every decision we make is going to be the best. But there are things that you want us to do that are good for us. And they're also acceptable and helpful to those around us. And in doing so, it brings about your perfect will. It's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand. If you have a decision to make, you come. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to In the morning. So, uh, and then David's <laughs> going to be convalescing with her, I think, for the week. That's right, exactly.